Hey, welcome back. A threat vector is a path or means by which a hacker or threat actor can gain access to a target. My name is Sushan Sutish, and I'm your trainer for this MS500 Microsoft 365 Certified Security Administrator Associate course. In this video, we're going to learn about threat vectors and data breaches. After this lesson, you would be able to understand the kill chain scenarios. You gain knowledge in understanding the workplace threat landscape and you understand different types of attacks as well. So without wasting any more time, let's get into it. Most attacks follow a common process referring to within the security industry as the kill chain. An attack follows a basic pattern and proceeds from one stop to the next in order to achieve the desired outcomes. This stepwise process can be defended against by implementing security measures on shock points in the chain. Since any step can be bypassed through various exploitation techniques, the best strategy applies defense at every step along the chain. The threat landscape across the globe has changed dramatically over the past several years with hackers using more sophisticated methods to compromise users and networks alike. At the same time, more and more organizations are enjoying the benefits of cloud computing. But as companies move to the cloud, they are understandably concerned how Microsoft 365 will protect their users and data from being compromised by cyber criminals. Let us have a look at the workplace and threat landscape. Office workers' expectations have changed dramatically over the last two decades. Compared to a few years ago, Companies today have many more factors to consider when dealing with different entities such as users, devices, apps, and data. While data is being shared with employees, business partners, and customers, organizations need to protect users' identities and data stored on their devices and apps. Organizations also need to mitigate the risk of providing flexibility and space while maintaining company security policies and detecting threats, all while giving workers a better and more productive experience. In today's cloud-centric world, organizations are faced with unregulated such as files on cloud storage services and the unknown such as advanced threat targeting users' email. This new normal is more difficult to protect because data is now stored everywhere. It's on on-premises, on PCs, on phones, and in the cloud. Microsoft is invested in addressing these challenges and in helping organizations be more secure by helping them to protect against, detect, and respond to a variety of threat vectors. First, let us understand what is phishing. Phishing is a technique a hacker uses to retrieve sensitive information such as users' account credentials or credit card number. For example, a user receives an email that appears to have been sent from a trustworthy source such as a bank or the user's IT administrator. Phishing attempts often entice users to click a link to a malicious website that looks legitimate except for the URL of the website in question. Upon entering the site, Users may be directed to enter personal information that hackers can then use to their advantage. Another possibility is that the site is infected with malware, which infects the user's computer with a payload such as virus. So what is virus? A computer virus is a type of malicious software program or malware. When executed, the virus replicates itself by modifying other computer programs and inserting its own code, infecting files or even the boot sector of the hard drive. The next way to infect someone's computer is by using Trojan horse. So what are Trojans? Trojans typically act as a backdoor that enables a hacker to control or use the infected computer to their advantage. Depending on its design, Trojans can perform many tasks, some of which include blocking antivirus software or installation of applications, stealing passwords and credit card numbers, and infecting other computers and devices connected to the same network. The next type of infection is rootkit. 
A rootkit is a type of malware designed to provide a hacker with administrative access to a computer without being detected. When used, a rootkit can provide a hacker with full access to the computer which can lead to stealing or falsifying documents. The ability to conceal other malwares such as password stealing keyloggers and viruses and using the computer for attacks on other computers as well. The next one is spyware. Spyware is often used to gather information about internet activities, keystrokes, passwords and other sensitive data. And spyware can also be used as adware where the software delivers pop-up ads in addition to tracking user behavior. This is an example of a phishing email. So phishing email usually contain branding and URLs that on the surface appear legitimate. They also typically convey a sense of urgency to persuade the user to act quickly. Now let's understand what is spoofing. Spoofing is a technique used to forge an email header so that the message appears to recipients as having been sent from a trusted source. By design, the simple mail transfer protocol or SMTP allows for a domain to send on behalf of another domain because there is a legitimate reason for doing so. For example, when you have hired an external company to generate and send out advertising or product updates on your behalf, or might have an application that spoofs your own organization to send internal notification by email. But spoofing is also used by attackers to trick the recipient into divulging information such as account credentials, credit card information, or other sensitive information. When a user sees the center information in the message, it looks like someone they know or domain they trust, even though the message was sent from an attacker. Let's understand what is spam and malware. While spam and bulk email are often a nuisance, they typically don't carry a payload that causes harm to user system. For the most part, they are usually unwanted email that get in the way of a user productivity. On the other hand, malware can cause great harm to an organization. Malware is a short form of malicious software which is often received in email as either an attachment or embedded link to a malicious website or file. Malware typically works in two stages. Stage one is the attachment or a website you visit that is infected and the malware uses code to exploit a user's computer using macros and JavaScript to plant a payload such as a virus or Trojan horse. Stage two is delivering this payload. So this is an example of a simple code, looks harmless enough, the two lines at the bottom of the image force the user browser to be redirected to the malicious website. The two lines at the bottom of the image force the user's browser to be redirected to a malicious website. So what is an account breach? An account breach occurs when a user's account is compromised, such that it can be used by an attacker to access network resource. If the account is an administrative account, then the hacker can immediately begin sourcing the network to gain access to critical data. If the breached account is a regular user, the hacker can use various techniques to obtain administrator privileges. This is referred to as an elevation of privilege. So one of the recommended methods that can be used to mitigate an account breach is to use multi-factor authentication. Now let's understand what is elevation of privilege. In an elevation of privilege scenario, an attacker has compromised one or more accounts and is now working to increase his or her power. In Microsoft 365, the target is usually global administrative privileges, but specific service privileges are also desirable if the targeted data is in that product or service. There are a few variations of the attack pattern that can occur. For example, if the initially breached account is a regular user, the attacker can either try to get that account promoted to a global administrator or they can use it to steal other accounts that have or can have administrative privileges as well. If the administrator share the same machine and the machine gets compromised, it then becomes easy for the attacker to figure out how to log on to the shared machine 
and run a credential harvesting tool. These credentials can then be used to access the system with administrator privileges. Now let's understand what is data exfiltration. Once a network is compromised, an attacker can use a variety of techniques to move data out of your tenant. Data exfiltration is the unauthorized retrieval of data from a computer or service. The data can be stolen in any number of ways, including through a breach of an account with access to data or through system and infrastructure attack that give the attacker local or system admin privileges to the computers that store the data outside of Microsoft 365. So how can you prevent data exfiltration? So there are several methods you can use. First one is access control list. You can establish standards for determining who should have access to specific kinds of data and then create processes to monitor and maintain those access controls. The second way of preventing is using external sharing policies. So you can prevent data leakage to external endpoints by configuring your tenant to restrict certain type of sharing. Another way to prevent is by using least privilege. Users will often grant permissions to document and document libraries that exceed the access that is required. So take the time to only grant the required minimum privilege to the smallest group of users that you can. So another key strategy you can employ is to set up and use data classification metadata, particularly with data shared on SharePoint sites and OneDrive. This requires you to determine a set of risk tiers, such as high business impact, medium business impact, low business impact, etc. And then require sites and documents to tag data in your systems with the appropriate classification. This enables you to monitor very sensitive data as well as leverage specific technologies to further protect high business impact data. And the last way is data loss prevention policies or using DLPs. The data classification scheme that is based on risk tiers is most effective when used in combination with the DLP feature in Microsoft 365. This technology enables you to configure rules about how to handle data moving in and out of your tenant. It can help you prevent sensitive document content from being emailed to external parties and prevent your users from sending social security number in emails. Now let's understand data deletion and spillage. Data deletion occurs when an attacker deletes your data, usually in a way that makes recovery difficult, if not impossible. A variant of this type of attack includes ransomware. With ransomware, an attacker compromises the network, encrypts data, and then demands a payment to get the key to decrypt the data. So how can you prevent data deletion? Your core prevention strategy should be to ensure that you have the sufficient redundancies built into your data management process to minimize the impact of data deletion. Data in Microsoft 365 is automatically backed up and made redundant for maximum availability by the service. However, it's still possible for an attacker to delete data from SharePoint sites and recycle bins, making it almost impossible to recover. Therefore, it's critical that you have a process for backing up mission-critical data to offline stores that you know how to restore. So what is data spillage? Data spillage occurs when protected data is transferred to a system that doesn't provide the same level of protection as the source. For example, sensitive data in your tenant spills outside the boundaries of your control. This can be caused by both malicious as well as non-malicious behavior. And now let's understand how you can prevent data spillage. One of the most effective methods for preventing the unexpected or malicious exposure of data outside your tenant include implementing a solution such as Azure Information Protection Policies, which can be used to classify, protect, and monitor the life cycle of documents and files. Documents that contain regular expressions like credit cards and social security number can be protected using data loss prevention policies. So what is coin mining? Cyber criminals are always looking for new ways to make money. With the rise of digital currencies, 
also known as cryptocurrencies, criminals see a unique opportunity to infiltrate an organization and secretly mine for coins by reconfiguring malware. So how coin miners work? Many infections start with email messages with attachments that try to install malware and websites hosting exploit kits that attempts to use vulnerabilities in web browsers and other software to install coin miners and websites taking advantage of computer processing powered by running script while users browse the website. So mining is the process of running complex mathematical calculations necessary to maintain the blockchain ledger. This process generates coins but requires sufficient computing resources. Coin miners are not inherently malicious. Some individuals and organizations invest in hardware and electric power for legitimate coin mining operations. However, others look for alternative sources of computing power and try to find their way into corporate networks. And these coin miners are not wanted in enterprise environments because they eat up precious computing resources. And cyber criminals see an opportunity to make money by running malware campaigns that distribute, install, and run Trojan mines at the expense of other people's computing resources. And what are the other type of attacks available? So two additional types of attacks worth mentioning are password cracking and malicious insider because both are used in the kill chain of events. So what is password cracking? In this scenario, an attacker has acquired access to an application, service, or data store that allows them to try many different password combinations for an account. Using specialized software, attackers can try thousands upon thousands of combinations in a very short amount of time. If the password is very short, very weak, very common, or the same as another account password owned by the user, the chances are very good that an attacker can guess the password and compromise the account. Another type of attack is malicious insider. In this scenario, one of your approved users is performing illicit activities in your tenant. These sorts of attacks can be the most damaging because the user usually knows a lot about your company and understand very clearly how to maximize the negative impact to the company and its data. Motivations of malicious insider vary but typically one include disgruntled employee looking for ways to make extra money, before leaving the company they want to cause issues for others and to simply spite specific individuals or organization as a whole. A malicious insider may even take steps to ensure long-term access by building in backdoor accounts or go straight to exfiltration or deleting sensitive data. Users with administrative rights are typically the most dangerous malicious insider. Alright, so that concludes the video on threat vectors and data breaches. In the next video, we're going to learn about security strategy and principles. So we'll see you on the next one. Till then, take care.